this, Lord. We want you. God, you promised if we would draw near to you, you would draw near to us. Lord, you said you would manifest yourself to us if we would obey you. And Lord, we want you, Lord. You said that you wanted people to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, that's what we try to do here, Lord. To worship you in spirit and in truth. To seek you. To do your will in everything. And Lord, we just pray today that your kingdom come and your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Not our will, but your will. Father, I pray right now for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to be upon the preaching and teaching of your word today. And Lord, I pray you help me communicate and share what you've given me to share this morning. I pray, God, that you give those watching and listening, those here today, those uh, online, that you will give everyone ears to hear and hearts to understand. Lord, those that have been deceived into some false doctrine away from the scriptures, I pray that you will open their eyes and they will receive correction. We pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated this morning. So we welcome everybody. Good to see everybody here. Those out there, we welcome those watching and listening from everywhere. We know from all over the place. It's pretty amazing. Um, y'all ready for this? I feel the preach coming on. I may be here. We may be here for a while. Is that all right? I may be here for a while. And some folks done irritated me. So you know what that means. Right? Hey, let me tell you something. I love it. You want to get you want to get me stirred up? Go ahead. And, go ahead and provoke me. You know, the Bible says don't provoke a king to anger. You know, we are kings and priests, right? Pro, pro, provoke the king to anger, you get what's coming to you. <laughs> Uh, but we got so much scripture to go into today. Now, what we're going to talk about today, I've covered before. Maybe not in the depth that I'm going to cover it. Even a couple of weeks ago, I touched upon it. But there's a reason why I'm going to delve back into this today. Because whenever there is a movement or an idea or a belief that's starting to be pushed, even by Christians, that undermines the scriptures. That's completely contrary. Completely opposite of what the Bible says. All right. And you see Christians literally getting upset and fighting for the thing that's opposite of what the Bible says. Then we have a problem. I'm also going to say this too. Look, I'm, a, I'm getting a little tired. There's, there's a whole group of folks out here that just almost, they try to lump every pastor into the same you know, just like they hate all pastors or all pastors, you know, they all, it was amazing. The whole group of people out there think they're smarter than every fivefold minister that exists. All right. And some of them hadn't been saved very long, but they think they know everything. And some of them are in that, what they would call the truthers. And I like what paint tank came up with that, that phrase, the goofer truthers. There's goofer truthers out there. And that's why I posted this morning, because as we get into this, and it'll probably be in the, one of the slides here, but I'm going to say it here at the outset, but listen, I do know there are very real conspiracies in the world, and I talk about them, okay? And especially, I say, if there's a conspiracy in the world and the Bible foretold it, in Bible prophecy, then you can bank on it. It's legit. I don't care how much evidence or there is or lack thereof. If the Bible says it, it's true. But let me go on in this and say, look, if your theories and your conspiracy theories or your belief system is contrary to what the Bible teaches, then you are wrong. Your theories are wrong and your belief system is wrong. I don't care how many people in the world are following after this. I don't care how many things you think you have to prove it. Remember, they showed us pictures from space, didn't they? Now, you can believe those if you want to. But you have a choice to believe those things like that or you believe the Word of God. It's that simple. Now, here in this church and really in the, in the true church of Jesus Christ, we're supposed to believe that the Bible is the inspired, infallible, inerrant words of Almighty God. God breathed. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And through archaeology and prophecy and manuscript evidence and everything else, we have absolute proof 
that the Bible is true and supernatural. It's not just written by men. It's supernatural. But, you know, that's for unbelievers to struggle with. Not us. Not us. Not Christians. But there is this thing now, you know, and, and I, look, I praise God. We use social media. We use the Internet. We use we used to use YouTube. I think we're still trying in a limited degree. We use Facebook. We use these things. But there are people out there that get their information from folks who are not called to preach and teach. They just took it upon themselves to preach and teach. And I, I just watch people just falling over these videos. Oh, that was just so good. And I'm just like, and, and they'll want me to watch it. And it'll be an hour, two hour long, and I'll start on it. And it's, when it starts getting unbiblical, I go, hey, I don't need to see anymore. I know where this is going. And so today, we're going to deal again with, and we're going to delve into this issue of the nation of Israel. The Jews and the Bible. And I renamed this. I did. I had a sermon from about five or six years ago. I had a title on it, Israel, the sign of God. And listen, one reason this is really important, and I've entitled this day, the rebirth and regathering of Israel. There are literally Christians now, and this movement is growing, that say, that the Israel that is there is, has nothing to do with the Bible or with God or with Bible prophecy, that it's a complete fabrication of the Rothschilds and the Illuminati and all this stuff. And, oh, you know, they, they have a you know, conniption fit over this star right here. And, yes, I know it's the star of Remphan. It's not the star of David. And, 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 and let me just get this across to you right now. I'm not saying today that everybody in the Israeli government or who lives in Israel is an angel. Okay? Nor am I saying that everybody that lives in Israel and claims to be a Jew is really a Jew. But let's get something real straight at the outset here. There are genetic DNA ethnic Jews that live in Israel. And then there are people who are not per se genetic ethnic Jews, but they converted to Judaism. Either way, they are considered a Jew, okay? Even going back to the Old Testament, we saw people convert from pagan, being pagans like Ruth, to becoming a Hebrew, a Jew, by choice to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, okay? So I'm getting a little tired of this nonsense and folks coming at me online with this nonsense. Look, what they're doing is, and what Satan is doing here, is one of the biggest fulfilled prophecies of the 20th century was the day that Israel became a nation again. And what people don't seem to get is it doesn't matter who was involved. Look, uh, somebody pull out a dollar bill for me, please. Somebody got one dollar bill. Just give me a one dollar bill, anybody. Maybe I do. Somebody do it faster than I can. There it is. All right. Now, folks, let me tell you something right now. Going on and saying like, oh, because they got the star of Remphan here and because there's some pagans or there's some Kabbalist or occultist or whatever you want to call it. There's some Jews that say they are not uh, that say they're Jews, but they're not. If you want to say uh, all of that. Well, let me tell you something. The moment you say, though, oh, well, they got that star of Remphan and the whole thing's evil, not of God. Or there's no Jews, there's no literal Jews there. Look, anybody could say, look, look, look at our money. What's on the back of here? In God we trust, but what God are they talking about? Because they got the all-seeing eye of Horus there in the pyramid, the Illuminati symbols right there on the back of our money. So somebody could say, oh, look at all you Americans. Y'all are all a bunch of Illuminati following evil people. God didn't have anything to do with creating your nation, blah, 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 blah. But what they ignore is history and the power of God and the sovereignty of God and the Christians that God used to form our nation, that it wouldn't be here without the Christians, and that it was an act, a sovereign act of God to form and sustain the United States of America for his purposes. Now, for the same reason, God said that he would restore 
the nation of Israel in the last days. This is Bible prophecy, and we're going to go through it. And he said he would bring Jews, Jewish people, Hebrew people of ethnic, genetic DNA descent. He would bring them back to the land from everywhere, from all over the world, from the north, the south, the east, and the west. And that this would be a sign to the world that you were living in the last days and you were drawing near the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, this is why the devil's trying to undermine this. Well, one of the reasons. Another reason he's trying to undermine this is because the devil hates the Jewish people and he hates Christians. The Jewish people have been persecuted for centuries and centuries and centuries Wherever they've gone, they've been persecuted. Well, the same goes for Christians. I wonder why that is. What do Jews and Christians have in common? Now, granted, they are deceived and don't know that Jesus is the Messiah, and there many of them are blinded. But what do we have in common? We both claim to worship the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We share a Bible, at least 66 books we share. And I believe many of them are going to come on over into this as we approach the end. But just because they've got some bad apples in there doesn't mean the whole bunch are a bunch of Satanists. You understand, or Kabbalists. Now, I know that their religion because they rejected Jesus Christ as the Messiah, their religion is antichrist. But is that how God wants us to look at them? Does God want us to boast ourselves how high and mighty we are against those branches that were cut off? We're going to see that in a minute. Does God want us to think we're something hot snot? I want to remind you that Romans chapter 1 says that the gospel was first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. And that doesn't mean just back then. And if we've got a snotty, boastful, arrogant, high-minded attitude against them, how in the world do you think we're ever going to win them to Jesus? Now, can I say something else to you? If I got to pick between an Israeli and a radical Muslim that I got to live with, who do you think I'm going to pick? Exactly. So we can say who, you know, all this stuff about, oh, Israel did this and did, did bleep, 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 back and forth. Look, I don't care. This conflict that's going on is Islam against Israel. But it's not just Islam against Israel. It's Islam against the world, really. Because if you're not Islamic, you're the enemy. You're the infidel. If you don't convert... Islam, folks, this is going to get something across to you. Islam is evil. It is satanic. It is demonic. It is a, a cult that worships death. And as it's been well said from the guy who runs Prager University, he made it very clear. He said, if, if Israel put down their arms today and said, we disarm." No more army, no more weapons, no more fighting. They would be annihilated in the days to follow. If the Arab nations put down their arms, there would be peace. Now, these are the facts. I don't see Israel trying to take over other people's land. They're not going over to Iran and saying, hey, we're taking this place. Hey, we're going to go over here and take Lebanon. Let's go take that. They just kind of want to have their little place, their little place that's not much bigger than New Jersey. And just want to have a place for their people to live. And you know what this was birthed out of? Somebody said, oh, it's the Zionist. Well, why? Why? What do you think the motivating factor was for them to have a nation? Because they were being persecuted in all these other countries where they were. And that persecution became so severe until you got Hitler. Now, there are people that deny the Holocaust and the persecution and killing of Jews by Hitler. If you're that person, you're sick in the head. 
You really are sick in the head. There probably is no hope for you. I mean, you can't, you, I mean, you, you're looking at as documented a history as you can look at. But, and I think, I think too, the Holocaust was foretold in the Bible. But that's another sermon. Let's get into this, though. Here's some of the stuff I get, and some of the stuff I say, let me read this to y'all. Uh, the rebirth of Israel, according to the scripture, only occurs after the tribulation. Isaiah 66 is in the context which is clearly a millennial reign context where Yahweh creates a new heaven, new earth, blah, 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 blah. All right. So they say Isaiah's prophecy must also agree with the rest of prophecy concerning the final gather, regathering of Israel and establishment as a nation by the Messiah, not Rothschild, Zionists, Freemasons, and the United Nations. Thus, Isaiah has to fit Jeremiah 23. And so they go on with this. So you see it. They claim it's all. And over here they say, uh, and Isaiah does... Or are we, when we throw out modern dispensational thinking of Zionist propaganda and blah, blah, blah. And I get those. Of course, many of these, anybody been seeing these lately? I see these all the time now. Israel today is formed in 19, it's not the Israel of the Old Testament. They have no idea what they're talking about. This one particularly irritated me. These pro-Israel Christians are bewitched. They are bewitched by Zionism. They are bewitched by the Zionist Notes contained in the Schofield Bible. They are bewitched by the false prophecy doctrines of dispensational futurism. They are bewitched by John Hagee, Robert Jeffries, Franklin Graham, Jesse Duplantis, Hal Lindsey, John MacArthur, David Jeremiah, Greg Laurie, and most Baptist Bible and charismatic Pentecostal churches. All told, approximately 80% of America's evangelicals are bewitched by the pro-Israel agenda. Never mind that the Zionist state is an atheistic antichrist state that is uh, in the arch enemy of genuine Christianity, freedom, basic human morality, and all things going, right? He says, and then, of course, there's the declaration, there are no Hebrews in the land of Israel, just Karzarian Babylonian pagans, better known as the cult of Baal. They, uh, they call themselves Jews, but they are not the synagogue of Satan. So y'all see it. All the, all the Jews in Israel, that... Karzarians. They're not real Jews. Um, and I said this earlier. I said if your conspiracy theory or believe propaganda contradicts what the Bible plainly teaches, then your theories and beliefs are wrong. So let's get into this. We're going to go through Romans chapter 11. So if you have your Bibles in here this morning, turn to Romans 11, because we're going to go through about four chapters of the Bible this morning, maybe five. Y'all think y'all can handle that? I didn't say four or five verses. I said four or five chapters. All right? And we're going to go slowly through them because some people can't seem to get what is plainly written. All right? Now, let me tell you, again, I'm going to state this a second time. I'm not saying that I endorse or I am for everything that the nation of Israel decides to do. They do some bad things sometimes, like all governments do, okay? Now, when it comes to who's committing atrocities in the current conflict, they are both sides are experts at war propaganda, all right? And let me go ahead and address that, yes, there is the rumor and the idea that Israel stood down and allowed the attack to happen, and they very well may have. Because you have to look at the big picture with them. Even though it's terrible that they would let some of their people die by standing down to give a pretext for something else. But you have to understand their mindset. You're looking at a people who wanted a piece of land to live in so they would not be persecuted and live under the constant threat of death. That's, the, that's your normal Jewish people. I'm not talking about your New World Order occultist who happens to be an Israeli or a Jew, or even an, an Ashkenarian Jew, whatever. We'll deal with that in a minute, too. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about your, your normal folks that are there. You know, the, the, the Mizraim, or the Mizraki Jews, the Sephardic Jews, the Ethiopian Jews. I've said this many times before. Um, but folks, let, let, let me tell you, God said, bottom line, you'll see it, God said he's going to have the Jews brought back to his land. 
So I, I don't care if there's bad ones mixed in. I don't care if there's fake ones mixed in. I don't care if there's evil ones mixed in. To the, we got them here in America. You know, just because I'm an American doesn't mean I'm a New World Order freak like Obama and Biden and some of these others, right? Don't put me in the same camp with them. Well, I'm telling you right now, there's some Jews in Israel. Don't put me in the same camp with the New World Order crowd that's trying to control and work in the Israel government like they are in every government of the world. All right? Let's be balanced and not psychos. Psychos go to the extreme. Everybody. No, we can't do that. Now, let's read this. This is Romans 11. We're going to start at verses 1 through 4. I mean, we're going through the whole chapter. So don't make sense take anything out of context because here's the whole chapter for you. All right, starting at verse 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin, God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Now, let's stop right there for a second. Paul is directly referencing physical, ethnic, genetic, DNA Jews, because he's saying, I am one of them. So this is what I'm talking about. I am of the tribe of Benjamin. I am a direct descendant of Abraham, one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is what he's talking about, ethnic Jews. Now you say, oh, well, they weren't called Jews back then. Yes, they were. Get sick and tired of it because it's just a reference from the era of Judea. But if you want to say Hebrews, you can say Hebrews. I don't care. God did not cast away his people. Somebody say, God did not cast away his people that he foreknew. Physical Jews. Yet there are Christians who say, that God cast them aside and now the church is Israel. That's called replacement theology. It's complete opposite of what this says. So if you're saying this out there, you are a liar. You are a deceiver. You are going away from what the Bible says. Say, well, Pastor Dean, that's, that's rough. Yeah, it is. I'm sorry. Because if you're out there saying that... Israel doesn't exist, that the, the Jews don't exist. There's no such thing anymore. The church are the, church are the Jews now. Because since we, be, we, we became believers, we're now the children of Abraham, and we're spiritual Jews, and so there's no need for physical Jews, and God forsook them, and God divorced them, and God cast them aside. But guess what? Y'all know there's Spanish Jews and Mexican Jews and... Did y'all know that? There's Ethiopian Jews, there's black Jews, white Jews. There's all kinds. And that just makes the devil, that makes the devil's little, you know, heart tremble. So then he goes on to say, he says, What know you what the scripture saith of Elias or Elijah, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone. And they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So what principles he trying to get across here? Well, he just said God has not cast off his people. He said, remember when, when Elijah said, there's nobody left but me. And the Lord said, no, there's a remnant that hadn't bowed their knee to Baal. Now, he's using this Old Testament story as an example of where they were at the time, and he's going to carry this all the way to the last days, this chapter 11. All right, let's keep going. Somebody say amen. All right. Oh, I went the wrong way. All right, we're just continuing. This is verses 5 through 7. Had to do this because you can't get a whole chapter in one slide, right? All right, Romans 11, 5 through 7. He says, even so, then, at this present time, also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Now, this is awesome. Because what he's saying is that even though the majority of Jews rejected Jesus, God still, by his grace, said, we're going to have a remnant of Jews that are going to carry this thing on, that are going to believe in the Messiah. And somebody just go ahead and, and, and let's just get this out of the way. 
all of the first church believers were Jewish, were Hebrews. Everybody. You understand? So he's saying, and he says, and if it's by grace, then it's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election obtained it, and the rest were blinded. So he's telling us here that physical Israel did not obtain what they were seeking. What were they seeking? Their Messiah. They wanted to know their Messiah. They wanted their Messiah to come, but they didn't get it. The majority of them did not get it, did not understand it, did not receive it, whether it be pride or religion or demons or whatever, just like most people don't get the gospel and accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, even though it's the best thing going. Right? But he said, the rest were blinded. Now, this is a spiritual blindness God put upon them because of their pride and their rebellion. Their sin of rejecting Jesus, the Messiah. God says, okay, you want to be blind? You're going to be blind. And this is why we've had them not, them resisting and not seeing now for centuries. They have paid, that, that race of people have paid a price for their rejection of the Messiah. All right? Well, let's go on. Romans 11, 8 through 10, he says, According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, unto this day. And David saith, now remember, Paul wrote Romans toward the end of his ministry. So he's talking about, this is after the New Testament's been implemented. This is after the churches have been started, and it, you know, this was to the Roman church. He says, unto this day that blindness is there. And David said, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Now this word, we read through these things. What he's saying is, David said, let their table be a snare and a stumbling block. And the recompense means that their payment they got. This is what it cost them. The wages of their sin of rejecting the Messiah, Jesus. This is what they got, this spiritual blindness and this persecution that came upon them, this hatred. He said, let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their way back, their back always, right? Now, now he goes into saying, explaining this. This is verses 11 through 16. Now, let's read these. We're staying in content. We're going through the whole thing. He says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Now, what he's asking here is, okay, yes, they stumbled. They didn't accept the Messiah, their Messiah. And they stumbled. But he's saying, should they fall, that they fall forever? That they're, that like God's done with them. And this is why I know this, because he says, God forbid, but rather that through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles. For to provoke them to jealousy. He says, now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. So does this sound like God speaking against them here through the Apostle Paul? He's saying, look, if, if by their rejection and their fall, the gospel went to the Gentiles and it blessed the whole world. He said, how much more? When they come into the fullness and understand that Jesus is their Messiah. He said, if their fall was bad, how much more will their return be a blessing to us? Y'all understand that? You got it? All right, let's keep going. He says, for I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify my office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are of my flesh. Now, so he's putting a difference here between him, the Gentile, and the Gentile Christians, and those who are of his flesh. What are you saying? The genetic, the ethnic Jewish people, my people. 
He said that I might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Now, what he's saying this, life from the dead means the resurrection at the end of the age. The dead in Christ, those who are dead in Christ will rise up first. The resurrection from the dead, then we which are alive and remain, will be changed in the moment. The twinkling of an eye will go from corruption to incorruption, from mortal to immortality. So he's taking this and saying, look, guys, if their fall, their stumble, their mistake led to the reconciling of the world, the gospel going to the Gentiles, what do you think it's going to be when they return to their Messiah, Jesus. It's going to be the resurrection of the dead. But we know when that happens, at the end of the age, at the second coming of Jesus. So he's already started to take us toward the end, right? Am I making this up or are we seeing this? I'm gonna pray it's going gonna, it's gonna to even be proved out even further here. He says, for the fr first fruits be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. Now he goes into this. Verses 17 through 21, he says, And if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, talking about us Gentiles, were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, meaning we were grafted into this thing started by Abraham, right? Finished by Jesus. He says, but we were, we were a wild olive tree. We had to be grafted into this tree. He says, so if you are a partaker of the root and fatness of this olive tree, boast not against the branches. Somebody say boast not against the branches. Now he's talking about those branches that just got cut, that got cut off because of their unbelief, because of their disobedience and their rebellion. Boast not. Now, let me ask you something. These people running around going, there is no such thing as Israel. We are Israel. I'm Israel. There are no Jews. I'm a Jew. I'm the top dog. What is, what is that? That's boasting. I don't know how else to define it. I don't, be, I don't go running around going, you know, I'm the one. I'm, 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 I'm it. I'm the big dog. I'm God's favorite. Ain't no more of these Jews. I'm the Jew. I ain't never said that in my life. Hallelujah. That's a good way. You know, what's boasting a manifestation of? Pride. Right? Then he goes on to say, he says, Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. So what he's saying is, is you're boasting, you're, you're just grafted in, but they're the root. Now you're boasting against where you came from. Why would you boast against what you came from? And he says, thou will say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off and you stand by faith. Be not high minded. What does high minded mean? Arrogance. I'm going to show you what it, what the, it actually means. Arrogance that injures other people. This is a different word than just your regular pride. It's a long Greek word. But he says, be not high minded, but fear for if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Meaning he cut them off because of their unbelief and their rebellion. You better watch out that you're not cut off for your arrogance and pride and rebellion. Against his people, because what is the context of this whole chapter he's talking about? The Jewish people, the Hebrew people. Watch, he's like, watch your attitude. Watch your attitude. Now let's look at the definition of this high-minded here. Here it is. It means, well, here, first, this first definition is boast. So the word boast is to glory against, to exult over. That is to boast oneself to the injury of a person or thing. Look at that. You know, the, they call it anti-Semitism which is just the word they have for it, just being anti-Jew or anti-Hebrew person. 
But y'all know, let me tell you something. Martin Luther, though he did a great thing by standing up against the Roman Catholic Church at the time when he nailed his 95 Theses to the door in Wittenberg and started the Protestant Reformation, but the man was far from being the perfect man or a perfect Christian. He liked to drink his beer, from what I hear. And he went out and tried to convert some Jews there in Germany. And they didn't receive it at all. So he got angry and wrote some very anti-Jewish things that later Hitler picked up on and used to persecute the Jews. So Martin Luther's negative attitude and negative words, boasting and being high-minded against the Jews brought injury, great injury to them. This is why Christians need to get their mouth off the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. And you should be praying for them. And I'm not saying we shouldn't pray for the Muslims. We pray for the Muslim nations as well. We want, as Christians both sides to be born again and come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior because all need their sins forgiven and only the blood of Jesus can wash their sins away. And they must believe in the Jesus, and I don't care if they're Jew or Muslim, they must believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh who died on the cross for their sins and rose from the dead, and they must accept him. They can't make up their own version of Jesus. Islam has their Isa that they say didn't die on the cross. That's making up your own Jesus. No, I don't care if you're Jew or Muslim. You still need to come to Jesus Christ and be saved. All right? And until then, you might be involved in any kind of wickedness. All right? But God doesn't want our mouth on them. Now, we can say, look, the Israeli government does something they shouldn't do. Yeah, we, we don't have to agree with that. We can say that's wrong. I went, uh, how, how many of you ever been to, the, to a Jewish synagogue and been through a service? Just three of us? How, how many of us in here ever been to the great synagogue in Jerusalem and sat through a whole service? I'm the only one in here. So I know that their religion is antichrist and dead. It's dead as a doornail. Okay? But I still know God's heart toward them. He wants them to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Messiah. And that is, I believe, a deep yearning of God's heart for them. That doesn't mean he won't rebuke them and punish them for their, their continual unbelief and resistance. But, folks, he said he did not forsake his people, which he foreknew, meaning he has not given up on them. So if God hasn't given up on them and cast them aside as if they don't exist, how are Christians doing this? What this is is ignorance of the word of God. See, there's a lot of people out there, there's a lot of Christians out there who think they know the word of God, and then there are ones, Christians, that really do. And this is what is annoying. Because, oh, they run their mouths, yip, 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 on social media. But you, I asked, like, the, this video someone sent us the other day. And Nancy, I listened to part of it, I had to turn it off. Nancy listened to more of it than I did. And it's just it's just nonsense. And, and we were talking about it at 3 o'clock in the morning. And she was, I said, I, so she went on and listened to it all, and I didn't. And I said, did, they, did the guy ever, he's a Christian, coming against Israel, coming against, there's, you know, coming against the whole thing. It's just a Zionist, this is a Rothschild creationist, blah, blah, blah. And, and this is a Christian guy, right? And I said, did he once bring up in the whole video Romans chapter 11? She said, nope. I said, I knew it. 
Because you can't bring up the chapter in the Bible that destroys your whole belief and your whole rhetoric and your whole idea, your whole theory. This blows it out of the water. This anti-Israel, anti-Jew belief, theories, rhetoric. Say, but Pastor Dean, Rothschild was involved. Yes, he was. And Cyrus... King of Persia was involved in sending them back, letting them go and rebuild the temple and even paid for it. So I guess that that was of the devil. But the whole time, though, the Bible says, see, that's what these the truthers would do. And the Christians who are ignorant of the word of God would do. They would go, oh, no, Cyrus, king of Persia, was involved in this whole building project. It must be evil. Yet Isaiah said, no, Cyrus is my chosen one to do this. In fact, the Lord said of Cyrus, I anointed him to do this. I put him in place as king to do this, whether he knows it or not. And when God says something's going to happen, he foretells an event. He will use anyone he so chooses to bring it to pass, whether they understand what they're doing or not. Whether they're the most righteous person on the earth or the most wicked person on the earth. Right? So all this stuff, I I remember people doing that to me like when God told me in, in 2016, God told me that the Lord said to me, my hand is upon Trump. It's my will for him to be president of the United States. It will be better for you if he's president of the United States. I will turn his heart toward me. Letting me know the Lord knew his heart wasn't toward him. And what the Lord was showing me was, I picked this man, and it, I don't, after that, it's irrelevant. It is irrelevant how many times he's been divorced. It's irrelevant how much he, you know, two Corinthians. I mean, it's irrelevant. <laughs> or him saying, I don't know that I need for, ever needed forgiveness. I mean, I don't care about his total lack of understanding of Christianity. If God said... That's who I want to be president because I'm going to use him to do some things that's going to help you and protect the nation. Guess what? I'll take him. If the Lord says Cyrus, king of Persia, is going to be a blessing to you, though he's a pagan, guess what? Okay, Lord, you do what you want, through whom you want, through whoever you want. Somebody getting this? The Lord also, I'm, I'll throw this in before we go any further. The Lord also said he, he picked Nebuchadnezzar and he used Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon to bring punishment and judgment on other nations. Right? How many of you know the Bible foretells in Amos and other places the destruction, the complete annihilation of Gaza? You say, well, what, they're, what Israel's doing is evil. Well, maybe in your eyes, but maybe it's the judgment of God and God just happens to be using Israel to do it. Like he's going to use some nations to chastise us. It's coming to America, yeah. Boy, the, the, the sleeper cells are here. Muslim, Chinese, Russian... They're ready to spring into action. Let's keep going. There's high-minded. All right. We're back to Romans 11. I told you the whole chapter. 22 through 24 here. Let's read this. He says, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell. Talking about the physical Jews. He says, Severity, but toward thee goodness. If, Jordan, Goodness toward us Gentiles, if we continue in his goodness. Otherwise, we shall also be cut off. Mm. This is right here is this right here scary verses. Because the Lord's talking about you, you guys boasting around, getting all arrogant and high-minded and puffing up your chest and everything about the Jews. Where are you living? Are you disobeying me? Are you disregarding my word? Are you blind to the truth? The same that he's telling me, the same thing that happened to them can happen to you. 
You better cool your jets. And they also, he says, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. Oh, come on now. He's saying the ones that the moment they step out of that unbelief, they're right back in. For if thou were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? The Lord's saying it's going to be easier to get them in than it was to get you in. Whew. Come on now. Now, here we go. I put this one. I changed it to this so I could get more verses in. This is 25 through 32. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Now, he's going to tell you a mystery about the last days. And he says this, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. So Paul's saying, I'm telling you this so you won't be wise in your own pride, in your own arrogance, in your own conceit. He said that blindness in part happened to Israel, meaning not all the Jews were blinded, but many were. Blindness happened in part to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Now, what is this term, the fullness of the Gentiles? This term, the fullness of the Gentiles, means that the, the, what brings everything to an end, the consummation of all sin, all prophecy, He's talking about here the last seven years that lead to the second coming of Jesus. This is the time of the fullness of the Gentiles. Meaning, what does the fullness mean? Every group or nation or whatever, there's always a cup of iniquity. I did a sermon many years ago called the cup of iniquity. Every individual has one, a church has one, a nation has one. A group of people, an ethnic group of people have one. It's a cup of, of, of iniquity. It's a cup of sin. And let me tell you something. When it gets full, the wrath of God gets poured out. And he's saying that we're coming to the place where the Gentiles had all this opportunity and all these blessings. But their sin cup is almost full and the wrath of God is about to be poured out upon the entire world. That is the end time, folks. That is the fullness of the Gentiles. He said, when that comes in, there's going to be another outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the Jews. I'll show you that. Watch this. So any Jewish people watching this, see, Pastor Dean loves you. And God's got a good plan for you. If you'll receive it. He says, blindness happened in part to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Look at the verse 26. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion a deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. And concerning the gospel right now, he says, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching election, they are beloved for the father's sakes. Now, wait a minute. He's saying, even though they are your enemies when it comes to the gospel, they are still beloved by God now that's hard for some of us to get a hold of isn't it but how about this scripture in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for the ungodly meaning he was loving us and dying for us while he knew before we ever even born and he knew us and he knew we were going to rebel and live in sin and evil and depravity and wickedness. And he still said, I'm going to go die for this sins. They're still beloved, even though I know what they're going to do. And then he says this about now, now We like to use this verse for us. In the church, but what is the context? The physical Jews. And he's saying, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Meaning, the promises he made to them, there will be a remnant that receive it. And if there's going to be a remnant to receive it, that means they would have to survive and exist at the end. 
Oh, don't shout me down now. Y'all are getting quiet out there. And then he says this, For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet now, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they may obtain mercy. Can, can I pause for Can we read that again? Because right, are y'all getting this? What are we, as Christians, what are we supposed to show to the Jewish people? Mercy. What is mercy? Mercy, the definition of mercy is literally undeserved, unmerited kindness. Meaning they don't deserve it. But you're to give it to them. So see, nobody's justifying their Kabbalah, occultism. Nobody's justifying their antichrist spirit. Nobody's justifying their sin or any war atrocities that they may or may not commit. Nobody's justifying that. When you say, I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to show mercy to them. I'm not going to deny them or say God threw them aside or they don't exist or God's done with them or they've been replaced by the church. No. Or like this other foolishness that's out here that the, the, the land of Israel that nothing that they claim happened there happened there. It all happened here in the United States. Like I said, Jesus was crucified in Utah. I'm telling you. But there's people I know embracing this foolishness. And he says here, he says, let's read this verse 30. He says, for ye in times past have not believed God. Talking about us, the Gentiles, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Even so, have these also now not believed, talking about the, the ethnic Jews, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy, for God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he had, might have mercy upon all. Oh, the depth and the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. And then he adds this, and I think this is for those who think they know things. He says, who hath known the mind of the Lord or who may or who hath been his counselor? Who hath given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again for of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So we actually just covered the whole chapter of Romans 11. Now, in that whole chapter, do you ever get the idea that God said, I'm done with the physical Jewish people. They have been replaced. They are cast aside. They are no more. No. That's not. And then also in this chapter, that's not supposed to be our attitude as Christians toward them. So if that's your attitude, you're in sin and disobedience, and you're going to bring judgment upon yourself because a haughty spirit brings destruction a prideful spirit brings what goes before a fall better you better get rid of this all right now we already see where the bible says that there are going to be ethnic dna genetic jews all the way to the end guess what The scientific studies now with the advancements in DNA research are discovering not just ethnic Jews, but they can figure out who are the descendants of the priesthood. They can, they've traced a genetic marker back to one man named Aaron. There it is. And some people say, oh, this is just Jewish research. No. These are researchers all over the world doing this work. Jitra, I'd like you to dig into this for me, since this is one of your areas here. But look at this. Jews are not descended from Khazar's Hebrew University historian. Says new study finds no evidence that Ashkenazi Jews are descendants of the Khazars. This is a fact, and I've actually gone to the published scientific studies in the journals that show this. This has been... Actually, actually, they started figuring this out in about 97, 98, and since then they've been, as the DNA process has gotten more and more sophisticated, they are finding out more and more 
Um, see, because the big thing is, listen, this is this is the big lot, one of the big lies that pretty much all of the Jews that are in Israel are Ashkenazi Jews and the Ashkenazi Jews were descendants of these European Khazars, rulers in Europe, who were Gentile rulers who converted to Judaism and then became the do dominant issue. But what the genetic research has discovered is that the majority of the Ashkenazi Jews are more related to the Jews from the Middle East than they are to any European entities. So what's being promoted by many Christians and even throughout the internet about the Ashkenazi Jew thing is a complete fabrication. Now, who would make up a lie? The devil. That's right. Who is a Jew can now be answered by genetic testing. Did you say that? Jerusalem Post. Going back to 1997, finding genetic traces of Jewish priesthood. DNA connection, the Kohanim, which is the priest. So here it is. And this is what I was going through last night. This is why I was up until 5 this morning, I think. I think I went to sleep about 6. Slept for an hour or two. Barely about an hour. No evidence from genome-wide data of Khazar origin for the Ashkenazi Jews. And this is, again, this is the big argument of the anti-Israel, anti-Jew crowd. That they're all Ashkenazi Jews and they weren't real Jews. And the genetic research has found, yes, they are. That the majority of them, the Ashkenazis, are descendant of Jews from the Middle East. Not people from Europe. Everybody hear that? I, I said that twice because I wanted to sink in, to, especially to hard heads out there. You having to ban people yet? Yeah, I told I I posted today. I posted today on my way before I, I left the house. I said I'm gonna I'm gonna upset some people today with the truth. But I'm digging through this. I, I mean just last night I hadn't had time to really dig through all these studies, but as you can see, one of the things it says down here in the abstract of this particular, it says, thus analysis of Ashkenazi Jews together with a large sample from the region of the Khazar corroborates the early results that Ashkenazi Jews derive their ancestry primarily from populations of the Middle East. These are peer-reviewed, published studies. Okay? They're not just fly-by-night, we made this crap up. Here's another one. There's multiple con contrasting patterns of the Y chromosome variation in Ashkenazi Jews and hosts of non-Jewish European populations. Just so you know, I'm doing my research. Washington Post, genetic links found in Jewish priestly class. Israeli researchers have found genetic links among contemporary members of Judaism's priestly class living on three continents, providing the first scientific evidence supporting the traditional belief that all such men are descended from the biblical high priest of Aaron. Now let's go to Zechariah. Y'all know it's only 12 o'clock, so we're doing good. Turn to your Bible, Zechariah 12. We got a few more chapters to go through. Say, Pastor Dean, I can't do this. You can do it. You can do it. All right, now let's read some of this. Because again, the context, the context of this, like we, we need to go to Ezekiel 36. I didn't put this in the power, that in the PowerPoint. But there's so much. But let's, let's look at this. Zechariah 12, 1. That the burden of the word of the Lord for Israel. Does it say for America? It says for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretches forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all people round about when they shall be in the siege both against Jerud uh, Judah and Jerusalem. Well, when will this be? He says, in that day, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. So I say all people. 70, this could not be a reference to 70 A.D. because you were only dealing with the Romans at the time. He says, no, this is an end time context. He said, I'm going to make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. Now, what does that mean, all people? Well, I looked it up in Hebrew and all meant all. 
And he's going to tell you it's going to be all nations. So this, I want to tell you, this hadn't happened before. So this is an end time prophetic reference to the nation of Israel, to the people of Israel who would live there, the Jewish people who would live there. He says, in that day, the Lord saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness. And I will open my eyes upon the house of Judah and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. Remember, he talks about in Armageddon, what? The horses. But we'll get to that in a second. Look at what he says here. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength in the Lord of hosts, their God. In that day, I will make the governors of Judah like a hearth of fire among the wood and like a torch and fire in a sheaf, and they shall devour all people round about them. Now, he's saying here, here's a prophecy that in that day, speaking of the last days, he's saying, I'm going to make the governors, the leaders of Israel, like a fire to devour all the people around them. Especially when he's talked about when they would be in siege, when, they, when, when the people around them would begin to come against them. It would be bad for them. Okay? So this can't be in the millennial reign. Remember we saw that guy saying, oh, no, the regathering of the Jews and all this stuff is in the millennial reign. No, 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 no. This is time of war. This is time when God says, I'm going to gather all nations against Israel to battle. He goes on and says, the Lord shall... He says, there, they, well, verse 6, they shall devour all people round about on the right hand and on the left. Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first. That's the West Bank. And the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. In that day, the Lord shall defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now, did he defend them in 70 AD? No, he let them be destroyed. He let Jerusalem be destroyed, the temple be destroyed. A million Jews died, and they were dispersed for 1,780-some years. So it can't be talking about 70 A.D. Everybody see that? And he says that in that day the Lord shall defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, and as the angel of the Lord before them. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Remember, in 70 AD, it was one nation. And God didn't destroy Rome at that time for what they did. This is called all nations. This is the end time judgment that the book of Revelation talks about. The day will come on the last day when the wrath of God comes, that every mountain is moved and every island is moved. And, and this, all the cities of the nations are going to be brought down to rubble in that day. But there's some that are going to get there before that through the war. He said, so this is, again, this is God showing you what time period he's talking about that he'll come to pass, he will seek to destroy all nations. Now this is Zechariah 12, 10 through 14. He said, and then at this time, and, so at the time when he comes to destroy all nations, he says, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness uh, for his firstborn. This is the, when their eyes, the blindness comes off. God pours his spirit out upon them and they fully realize we have not believed, we have rejected our Messiah all these years. They shall look upon me whom they pierced. Now, how can there be people to look upon? How can there, I mean, if there's not people in Israel that are true Jews, how could this come to pass? And then he tells you when it's going to be. He says, in that day, there shall be a great morning in Jerusalem, a morning in Hadadrimon, and in the valley of Megiddon. What is the valley of Megiddon? It is the valley of Armageddon. This is when, what, what happens? If we go to Revelation 16, Jesus says, says I'm going to gather all the nations, all the armies of the world to the valley of Megiddo to deal with them there. 
So this is, again, end time context. And the land shall mourn every family apart. The family of the house of David apart and their wives. And the family of the house of Nathan apart and their wives. And the family of the house of Levi apart. Now, in time context, and he's talking about families that are descendant of the 12 tribes here. Am I making this up? Is this the context of the Bible? Let's keep going. Zechariah 13, next chapter. 1 through 5, in that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. Well, what, what is that fountain he's talking about? There is a fountain that flows from who? Emmanuel's veins. It's going to be open to them because they're going to finally believe that their Messiah was not just come to become a political king, but he came to be the Lamb of God. And they're going to understand this. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land and they shall be no more remembered. And also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirits to pass out of the land. Now, has that ever happened before? He's like, I'm going to cause uncleanness to be gone out of the land. This only happens at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And it shall come to pass that when any shall yet prophesy, then his father and mother begin and say, thou shalt not live for thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord. Why is he talking about this? He said, because this is the time where prophecies will cease. We won't need tongues and interpretation of tongues and prophecy when Jesus splits the skies and starts down here. That's over with at that point. And anybody standing up saying, I'm going to prophesy at that time. Oh, no, you don't. And then he says, and it shall come to pass in that day that the prophet shall be ashamed every one of his vision when he hath prophesied. Neither shall he wear a rough garment to deceive, but he shall say, I am no prophet. I am a husbandman, for man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. Verses 6 through 9. And one shall say to him, what are these wounds in thy hands? Then he shall answer those in which I was wounded in the house of my friends. So this is them seeing Jesus, the Jews, and saying, what are these wounds? We don't understand this. See, that's not can't refer to Christians because we know what the wounds are about. Right? But they didn't, they don't know that. So they're like, what are these wounds? And he said, I got it in the house of my friends. Then, of course, he gives the prophecy. They slipped these prophecies in about smiting the shepherd. Remember, Jesus quoted that about himself when he was crucified. But look at verse 8 and 9. He says, and it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined. And will try them as gold is tried, and they shall call upon my name, and I will hear them, and I will say it is my people, and they shall say the Lord is my God. So what's going to happen is when this great war in Armageddon and, and the Antichrist invades, it says here two-thirds of the Jewish people or the people that live in Israel will not survive. That's how bad the war is going to be. But what God is doing, he is cleaning out the ones who are rebels and want to be wicked and the ones who are really hungering for him he's going to said that's why he said i'm going to bring a third part through the fire and refine them and they're going to call upon me all right now how could this be if god is done with them if god has cast them aside if they don't exist Zechariah 14, I'm trying to go through this quick. Now look at this. Behold the day of the Lord. Somebody say the day of the Lord. Day of the Lord. It's a bad day. It's that end day. And what does he say about it? He said, but the, behold the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Somebody say all nations. All nations. That means Russia. That means China. That means all the Arab nations around. That means everybody. And we might have a stupid president like Biden that, get, that joins in with him. That's another sermon, though. Look at that. It says, For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the house rifled, the women ravished, and half the city shall go into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Remember, Matthew 24, he tells them, When you see the abomination of desolation stand in the holy place, when the Antichrist steps into the rebuilt temple up there, he said, you in Judea flee. 
Why? Because the West Bank is made up of a big population of Jews and Palestinians. And meaning when the armies of the Antichrist move in, that the Jews who live in that region will be overwhelmed and in grave danger. That's why he tells them to run and not even worry about packing up. Just get out of there. He says, then, meaning after this happens, the Lord's going to let them invade. He says, then, after this, then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he had fought in the day of battle. So the Lord's going to split the sky, come on down and start, start fighting. How many of you know when Jesus steps down and starts fighting, he's going to win? Amen. And that's why it says his feet. Whose feet? His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. I've been, I, on the east, I've been there. I've stood there. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a great valley, very great valley. Rather, half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. And you shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azel, and you shall flee like you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the, the Lord my God shall come and all his saints. What day is that? Where is all this taking place? Utah or the Mount of Olives? Salt Lake City or Jerusalem? I cannot even believe that some of this nonsense is being taught now. Now, verses 6 through 11, Zechariah 14, and it, sh and it shall come to pass in that day that that the light shall not be clear nor dark. Now listen, listen to this. This is a direct reference to when Jesus comes. Remember when Jesus comes, he said, we won't even need the sun and the moon anymore for light because he's going to be the light, right? Look what it says right there. But it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. And it shall be in that day that living water shall go out forth, go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea. In the summer and the winter shall it be. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day. And there shall be one Lord in his name one. Y'all see that? And the land shall be turned as the plain of Gibeah and to Rimmon south of Jerusalem. And it shall be lifted up and inhabited in her place for, from Benjamin's gate unto the place of the first gate unto the corner gate and from the tower of the Haniel gate unto the king's wine press. Now, verse 11. And men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. Are they safely inhabited now? No. I was there when the bombs and the bullets were flying, the first go around. No. This is talking about the day when the Lord comes. What does it say? The Lord will be king over all the earth. Now, wait a minute. Now, I thought Jesus is already king over the earth. No, this is coming when he comes and takes possession. Somebody say second coming of Jesus. It's kind of like that the people that say that the gifts of the Spirit are gone and done away with. And yet the Bible says that in the last days, I'm going to pour out my Spirit on all flesh and your sons and daughters will prophesy and all that. It's like he tells us it's going to, those gifts are going to operate all the way to the very end. And we got church people telling us that they, they ceased. Y'all get what I'm saying? This, this is the same stuff. God shows us there's going to be ethnic Jews in the land of Israel that will finally see him and he will be revealed to them and they will call upon him and they will be saved. How is it that you say it doesn't exist, Christian? Now, either you're woefully ignorant of the Bible or you've just been deceived. Or maybe you're a troll. I don't know. Maybe you're an agent working for the other side. You know, what's, what's amazing is that I've been in Israel. I've been around Jews a lot in my life. And when I tell them, I love Israel. I love the Jewish people. They look at me with this puzzled look and go, what? What did you say? Everybody hates us. I said, I don't. And they look at me like, why? I said, well, because my Lord and Savior told me to love you. And that the gospel was to you first, even before it was for me. And they'd be like, what are you talking about? And then I start telling them, do you know about Isaiah 53? 
You know your prophet Isaiah? He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. By his stripes we are healed. Chastisement of our peace was upon him. I said, who do you think that's talking about? And I've seen them. Tears start running down their face. You think I'm winning one of them saying that you don't exist anymore? It's like these goofballs that tried to say a while back that Australia didn't exist. I think Australians think it exists. But anyway. Joel chapter 3, he says, For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, when I say, that means when I regather them back, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat or Megiddon or Armageddon. And I will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. So God is specifically saying where he's going to gather these nations to destroy them to the where his people whom they scattered to the nations where else can that be the land the literal land of israel the literal valley of megiddo which is also called the valley of megiddo or the valley of jehoshaphat and he says and they have cast lots for my people they've given a boy for a harlot and sold a girl for wine trafficking that they might drink yea what have I to do with the Otiri, which is the region Tyre and Zidon is Lebanon, and all the coast of Palestine, or which is Gaza? And he says, "Will ye render me a recompense? And if I, and if you recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? Because you have taken my silver and my gold and have carried it into your temples, my goodly and pleasant things. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have." You sold to the Grecians that you might remove them from their border. What he's saying, you've sold out my people again because you're trying to remove them again. This chapter is about Armageddon. He says that toward the end of it, he goes on to say, prepare for war. Let's keep going. Now, why is this important again? Because prophecy is proof. It's proof that the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Yahweh, Jehovah, Elohim, the Lord Jesus Christ, it is proof that he is the one true God. And the Bible is the only divinely inspired book or message that he's given us. Prophecy is the proof. And this is what the Lord said, Isaiah 45, tell Tell ye and bring them near and let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord and there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior? There is none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth for I am God and there is none else. But I tell you these things. He's saying, I tell you these things from ancient times. And why does he say I tell you these things from ancient times? He said, Declaring, he said, I'm the Lord who declares the end from the beginning, from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. He said, because you, he said, I will also do it. He said, hearken unto me, you stout hearted that are far from righteousness. Why do I tell you things before they come to pass? Number one, so that you'll believe and quit being prideful and stubborn. See, there is no excuse. Now. I want y'all to put up this. I want y'all to go. I'm not, I'm not going to go any further with this. I want y'all to put up real quick. This is what we're going to close with. We're going to close with Ezekiel 36. We're going to read some verses here. So now that we have the context of Romans 11, Zechariah 12, 13, and 14, four chapters of the Bible, right? Now you need the fifth. Somebody say fifth chapter today. Y'all okay with this? Can we read a little bit? All right, let's put up. You got Ezekiel 36, verse 1 is where we will start. Also thou son of man prophesy unto the mountains of Israel and say ye to the mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Did he say prophesy unto the mountains of Utah? No. Saith the Lord, because the enemy hath said against you, 
has said against you, aha, even the ancient high places are ours in possession. Keep going. Therefore prophesy and say thus saith the Lord God, because they have made you desolate and swallowed you up on every side that you might be a possession unto the residue of the heathen and that you are taken up in the lips of the talkers. I like this. You're taken up in the lips of the talkers and are in an infamy of the people. Remember, see, all the Jews, what he's talking about there, the mountains of Israel, he's talking about the, the people as well. He said, you're an infamy of the people. I mean, the whole world just can't stand you. All right? Therefore, you mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. The Lord God, I hear the word of the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God to the mountains and to the hills and to the rivers and to the valleys and to the desolate waste and to the cities that are forsaken, which became a prey and a derision to the residue of the heathen that are round about. And he says, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the heathen and against all of Udameh, which is basically Esau, which is the region of Edom, Ammon, and Moab, which is the land of Jordan at this time. He said, which have appointed my land into their possession with the joy of all their heart, with despiteful minds to cast it out for a prey. Because let me just say this. The Jordanians act like they're all fine and dandy with, with Israel, but they're not. They are still mad that they got shoved right on out of the West Bank in 1967. They got embarrassed, defeated. All right. Prophesy, therefore, concerning the land of Israel, and say unto the mountains, and to the hills, and to the rivers, and the valleys, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I have spoken in my jealousy and in my fury, because you have borne the shame of the heathen. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, I have lifted up my hand. Surely the heathen that are, are about you, they shall bear their shame. So he's letting them know, the, 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 the ones around you. But ye, O mountains of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people of Israel, for they are uh, at hand to come. Now, look at this. He says to, before the Jews started returning home to the land of Israel, it was a desolate place. Mark Twain went there and said it is completely unusable, desolate, desert, no water, no nothing. And the Lord says here, now go back, go back one. He says, you mountains of Israel, you're going to shoot forth your branches. I mean, stuff's going to start to grow. And you're going to yield your fruit to my people, Israel, for they are at hand to come, meaning they're going to, they're about to return. And when they return, the land's going to come back to life. The literal land comes back to life. Let's keep going. For behold... I am for you and I will turn unto you and you shall be tilled and sown. And I will multiply men upon you, all the houses of Israel, even all of it. And all the cities shall be inhabited and the waste shall be builded. Okay. And I will multiply you upon man and beast and they shall increase and bring fruit. And I will settle you after your old estates. Wait a minute now. I will settle you after your old estates. Meaning you used to be there as a people, but it's been a wasteland. But I'm going to settle you back there again. And we'll do better unto you than at your beginning. Somebody say better, better. than at your beginning. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. Meaning that in that day, their eyes, the spirit of grace and supplication is going to come upon them. Their eyes are going to be open to Jesus. Let's keep going. Yea, I will cause men to walk upon you, even my people Israel, and they shall possess thee, and thou shalt be their inheritance, and thou shalt no more henceforth bereave them of men. So he's talking to the mountains of Israel, and he said, to the mountains of Israel, I'm going to cause men to walk on you, even my people Israel. Meaning Jewish, Hebrew descendants are going to walk on these mountains again. Let's keep going. Thus saith the Lord God, because they say unto you, Thou land devourest up men and hast bereaved thy nations. Therefore thou shalt devour men no more, neither bereave thy nations any more, saith the Lord. Neither will I cause men to hear in thee the shame of the heathen any more, neither shalt thou bear the reproach of the people anymore, neither shalt thou cause thy nations to fall anymore, saith the Lord. 
Keep going. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their own doings. Their way was before me as the uncleanness of a removed woman. Wherefore, I poured my fury upon them for the blood that they had shed upon the land and for their idols wherewith they had polluted it. And I scattered them among the heathen, and they were dispersed through the countries according to their way and according to their doings. I judged them. And when they entered into the heathen, whether they went, they profaned my holy name. They said to them, These are the people of the Lord that are gone forth out of his land. But I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whether they went. So he said, even when they went, when they left, they continued with their Kabbalah, their other nonsense, their tree of life and their angel worship and all this stuff. He says, therefore, say unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the heathen, whither you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which you have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. And we'll just stop right there. Now, this is the Bible. And he's saying, I scattered you. I judged you because of your sin. And even when you went to Europe and everywhere else, you got into all kind of other foolishness and idolatry and created, you know, all this, the Mishnah and the Talmud and all this stupid stuff. And the Lord's saying, you know what? I'm not even doing this for you. I'm doing it for my name because I said I was going to do it. Think about that. So again, nobody's saying that just because somebody's a Jew means they're an angel or they're righteous or they do everything right. No, even God says they don't. But he said, I'm doing this for my own name's sake. And I'm taking you, and as a sign to the world, I'm taking you out of all these countries where you've been scattered, and I'm going to bring you back to your own land. And see, this is really the issue. It was like, well, the United Nations and Britain and uh, the Rothschilds and everybody joined in to help. Let me, let me tell you something. David, if you go back to King David, you remember when he bought the threshing floor? Remember he, he went to, to offer a sacrifice to stop the plague, remember? The Lord told him, that's that Mount Moriah area. And the Lord told him, go by this threshing floor. And the guy comes up and the guy said, oh, man, just take it. You're the king, man. I'll just give it to you. And David said, I will not. I will not take this for nothing. I will pay what it costs. Now, let me tell you what that was. That was a Jew buying some land. 3,000 years ago. Bought and paid for, recorded, deed right there. That's your holy. So I don't want to hear any arguments about whose land it is. Yeah, God's run them out of there several times. But just because some other folks moved in and were squatters doesn't mean that it was theirs. Now, when the United Nations partition came in and they decided, said, look, we're going to give the Jews this little bit of area here that's historically we know was theirs. And we're going to let you refugees. And, th and folks, there really are no such thing as Palestinians. You know that it's made up. There's no Palestinian language, there's no Palestinian culture, no Palestinian history. In fact, the word Palestinian in Arabic is Philistine. That's how it's pronounced in Arabic, Philistine. And they happen to live in the main area of the Philistines, which is Gaza. All right. What these people are that are there, there are people that live there, mingled in and out of there from Egypt and from Jordan area and from Lebanon. They are mostly people that are from different na nations and they live there in and out, but never in a great majority. In fact, I have the numbers and I'm not putting it up today, but I have the numbers of immigration 
that's gone on there since the late 1800s. There's always been Jews there. There's always been Arabs there. There's always been Christians there. <laughs> Some, that nut in that one video said that, oh, back then, all the Jews and Christians and Muslims for thousands of years got along. And I'm like, what crack pipe have you been smoking? <laughs> Muhammad did not make peace with Jewish people or Christians it, the only peace he would make with them was if he felt outnumbered until he could get in a stronger position to attack them later. Or he would persecute them and tax them to, to no end and make basically make them slaves. Don't tell me. And that's, that's before he decided if he really just didn't like you anymore, he was going to cut your head off. So don't tell me that Islam got along with the Jews and with Christians in the Middle East for thousands of years. That is the, the, the most idiotic thing I think I've heard lately. All right? Do people even have a, know anything about the history of Muhammad and Islam? I, I just marvel at this. Um, <laughs> folks, I, here's the thing. We just need to be praying. But don't let anybody steal from you. I could go through more chapters of the Bible. To show where God said he's going to bring his people back to their land in the end. In fact, well, you know what? Let me put the PowerPoint back up. I'm going to show one more thing. Y'all don't mind this, do you? I didn't get up here until after 11 sometime. Got to milk every minute we can. Yeah. What was it physical land? Really? I found out something about. I know. Isaiah's prophecy here. This is very powerful. Well, we'll I said we'd end on thirty six. We got to end on this. Isaiah seven fifty B C. So this is about 100 years, maybe not quite, but 100 to 150 years before the Babylonian invasion and captivity and dispersion. All right. And Isaiah prophesies here. He says, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time. Somebody say second time. Second time. To recover the remnant. Somebody say the remnant, the remnant. of his people. There it is. Which shall be left from Assyria? They say for Utah. No, from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, which is Iran. Pathros is Egypt. From Shinar, Babylon, Iraq. From Hamas, from the, from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign. And this is the Hebrew word neck. It means a flag, a signal, and a sign for the nations. And I shall and shall gather the outcast of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Everybody see that? He talking about Americans? Americans didn't exist at this point. Christianity didn't exist at this point. So who's he talking about? And then we see. Amos 9 foretold this. He said, and I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof, and they shall also make gardens and the fruit of them, and I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord. Now, that could not be the Babylonian captivity return, because he says they would be no more pulled up, but they, yet they were again in 70 A.D., they were pulled up and scattered. So this has to mean the second time that Isaiah was talking about. And he said, when they brought back the second time, it's a sign to all the nations that I have done this. You hear me? Israel is a sign of God. That he is alive, that he is still involved in the affairs of this world and that the Bible is true. 
from Genesis to Revelation that is divinely inspired. See, this attack on the nation of Israel and the nation of Israel returning to the land is an attack on Bible prophecy. Thus, it is an attack on the word of God and the, and the character of God. Because he said it. It's going to be a sign to the nation. So he said, look, this, this, is why, this is why I know that even though they're going to take a hit, they're going to survive and the remnant's going to turn to Jesus and Jesus himself is going to intervene for them and there's going to be a remnant of Jews left because he said they will be no more pulled up from their land. The little bitty nation of Israel surrounded by 22 Arab nations, Muslim nations, is going to survive because of the Lord. Because of God Almighty, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, our Lord God, Creator, Messiah, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. They shall no more be pulled up. See, there it is. There was the first scattering and return, 606 B.C. to 5, and then they returned 536. Captivity return, and there was the second time. There it is. It did happen, folks. I remember hearing of, like, older people back, say, in the and when this happened, I remember hearing people talk about their grandparents that were preachers. That when this happened, like they just, everything just shut down. Like they just quit. They were in awe. Because because in, in 1946 and 7, even even the years leading up, it, it looked like it was impossible and it would never come to pass. And when it did, it shook people. I remember people talking about missionaries. And pastors just sitting down going, oh, my God, this is happening. And that's what Satan is trying to steal. Now, it's not even real Jews there. That land means nothing. Well, do you think I've read you enough Bible this morning to prove otherwise? Oh, I know I just made all kind of people, man. I got those three words for you. I don't care because the truth of God's word is the truth. Somebody asked me, he said, well, the Palestinians say that the Israelis bombed the hospital and the Israelis say the Palestinians bombed the hospital. And I said, I said, who knows what the truth is? I don't know. Who knows? But for the Christians, Yes, that's horrible, but it's not the point who did it. Right? The point is where we know this is headed. And so our job is to preach the word of God, to preach the truth about Bible prophecy and to stand firm. So people can say you're pro-Israel, you're pro-Palestine. Let me tell you something. I'm not, I'm not pro-Islam at all, never will be. And I'm not pro-Judaism either, because it's wrong. Okay? I just know who I'd rather live with if I had to pick one. Okay? But still, the issue is not. Now look, the other day there was a preacher that's famous that said we ought to just blow up. The, the, the Israelites ought to just, just level Gaza and blow up the Dome of the Rock and put their temple up there so we can hasten the second coming of Jesus. I don't agree with that at all. That's extremism. Christians should not be advocating for any type of violent strikes on people that where innocents could be killed. We don't want war. It's not when we talk about Bible prophecy and about the wars that are going to happen that we want them to happen. We're just saying we know because it's written in Bible prophecy in the word of God that it is going to happen. I don't want to see a child harmed or... I, you know, I hate seeing people burnt and burn up and killed and maimed and everything else. I don't know about y'all, but, you know, I thought one of the cruelest things that ever happened in the Gulf War was, was remember when the retreat happened from Kuwait? And you had all those guys retreating from Kuwait, and we just bombed the snot out of them on that road. And I saw the video, the, the raw video. 
of human bodies charred beyond recognition, sitting in vehicle after vehicle after vehicle. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants it. Not, not a real Christian. Nobody wants that. But we're not going to be able to stop it. And Jesus foretold, the prophets foretold, the apostles foretold these things so we would not be caught by surprise or be terrified beyond our ability to think so that we would know what's going on. So we would be prepared mentally, emotionally, physically, fi financially. We would do whatever we needed to do. I thank God he told us ahead of time. I long for the day. See, the only, I know this because I know the Bible. The only time there's going to be no more war is when Jesus comes here, wins the war, makes everybody get rid of their weapons of war, and he rules the nations with a rod of iron. That's the only time we're going to have peace, true peace, and no war for a thousand years until Satan is loosed for a little season because God's got to filter out the rest of the rebels. But he doesn't even let them get to a war. They just surround the camp of the saints and fire comes down. <laughs> That's it. Crispy critters. But think about that. No no more war. No war for a thousand years. Every weapon of war will be turned into farm equipment. Think about that. Somebody say the answer is Jesus. Amen. Let's stand. I know that was a little long, but that was going. When we have a PowerPoint, it's about 60 slides. That's what it takes. Now, let me go ahead and announce real quick to the social media world. If y'all come at me with this nonsense, you will be blocked, banned, faster than you can blink your anti-Israel eyes. <laughs> because I'm done listening to foolishness. I'm not wasting my time on false doctrine, arrogance, boasting, proud, blaspheming, disrespecting of God's word from Christians. I am not going to deal with you. It's going to be goodbye. If my page so distresses you, go find others that make you happy. Stay off of mine. You're not going to come on mine and teach your false doctrine. My platform, people say, well, what about free speech? It's my platform. There is no free speech. I'm not the United States of America. You don't get to use my platform to teach your false doctrine. That's the same as I wouldn't let you come to this pulpit and teach false doctrine. You're never going to be allowed to stand here and teach false doctrine. So why would I let you do it to the thousands of people on my social media pages? Not going to happen. We're going to say bye to you. See you on your way. Let God deal with you. Amen. So there's your warning. I had somebody coming at me about the Mandela effect. That's another one. Can I just say? The Bible says the word of God will not be changed. And we've got Christians saying that there's some quantum supernatural effect that the devil and the people are changing the word of God supernaturally. And I'm just like, okay, God said it's not going to be changed. You're saying the word of God's being changed. Who do I stay? Who do I stick with here? I told one woman just the other. I said, you know what? She's talking about pushing that Mandela effect thing. I'm like, it's all boils down to bad memories and different translations every single time. And she was like, I just pray God will open your eyes. I just said, you're deceived. You're deceived. The one thing that we know, God said he would not allow to be changed. Not that they wouldn't create different variations of it to try to get people away from the original, but he promised we would always have the original with us. And we do. Period. Amen? So Mandela effect people, 
you're going to be sent. Block ban. See you later, alligator. <laughs> so let's do, what was that song we did that I liked this morning? Huh? Yeah, let's do that. Y'all, y'all ready to worship one time? Can we do one song before we leave? Y'all know that people online, though, there are people online right now that are just saying, keep going. Keep going. They like me to preach for like three hours. Just keep going. <laughs> now, there's a few white folks. <laughs> but that's, you know what? And yeah, and really the Africans, they don't care, man. They'll stay there all day and night, you know, once they get there. If they just get them there. <laughs> I've had services, African services, start, supposed to start at 7, and I didn't start preaching until 10, 1030 at night. Right. Like, and pre- then, yeah, then we stay in all night. Uh-huh. Yeah. African time, we call it. Yeah. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word and what you're doing, Lord, to show your great name. And you're going to reveal yourself, Lord, to many that now, right now, are blinded and deceived, whether Jew or Gentile. You promise you're going to open some eyes in these last days. You said you were going to turn many to righteousness that many would see and accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior and be born again. They would come to know the Messiah, the true Messiah that suffered and died on the cross was the sacrifice for our sins that made the blood atonement, the ultimate blood atonement, the blood of God shed on the cross. And Lord, we thank you for the power of your resurrection that you rose from the dead on the third day because death could not hold you. You are the prince of of life, of eternal life. And Lord, we exalt you today. And we pray that people's eyes are open, that your prophecies of these end times are being fulfilled one after the other after the other. You warned us there were going to be some bad things that are going to happen. But to not be afraid, to not be troubled. These, you said in your word, these things must come to pass. So, Lord, we know your wisdom, you're full of wisdom, and you know the end from the beginning. And if you say they must come to pass, then they must come to pass. But we're going to believe the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. We're going to believe every word's important. We're going to believe that you're doing a thing in Israel, whether people want to acknowledge it or not, with the land and with the people, and that there are real Jews there. And we're going to bless them and pray for them. And we know their eyes of a remnant toward the end is going to be open fully. And we thank you for that. And we ask you, Lord, just now as we take a few last minutes, a few minutes to just worship you before we leave. Let you know we love you, Lord, and we love your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord, you are holy, holy, holy. The one true God, the creator of heaven and earth. The name that is above every name, the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Messiah, the promised one. Lord, we worship you. We love you. We thank you. God, we ask you to bless your people. I ask you to bless your people here today and those watching and listening and those who will watch and listen. God, give them ears to hear and a heart to understand. Your prophecies are being fulfilled, Lord, right before our eyes. We know you're coming soon, and we're ready to endure to the end that we may be saved. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. Amen. All right. Well, you know the drill around here. Is there any announcements? Why do I think there's one? I don't know. There's something I was thinking about last week. We thought we should announce, but I can't remember now. I guess it's not that important. All right. But anyway. Uh, We're going to say bye to everybody out there, and uh, y'all hug some necks before you leave. Amen.